lead us through this topic, please join me in welcoming a recognized leader who has been at the forefront of movement politics for nearly three decades. An internationally recognized, indeed, innovator in technology and digital pioneer, please welcome Mr. Joe Tritty. Joe. Thank you. Okay, well, I, I know what you all have to be thinking. How, how is it that Joe Trippi, the guy who ran Howard Dean's campaign for president, got into this room? <laughs> and and I, I gotta be honest with you, I, I have no idea how it happened. I mean, you think you're surprised to see me. I'm pretty surprised uh, to, to be here. Uh, but no, it's really, uh, an honor uh, to be part of the 25th anniversary celebration of George Herbert Walker Bush's presidency. And I think it's actually even, to me, more impressive um, to not just hear all the accomplishments in, in, in the Americans with Disabilities Act and, uh, and Clean Air Act and the other accomplishments that we heard about this morning, foreign policy and defense, um, but that then on the 25th anniversary to turn the page a little bit and look into the future and, and, and actually start to ask some of the tough questions that future policymakers and future administrations are going to have to deal with just speaks to the president's leadership and his dedication and to what this facility and the, and the uh, Bush Foundation is about. So that, that matters a lot to me, and I'm really honored to be here with you. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about... Uh, where we are, and we are in a new, uh, a new digital age. Forget everything that you think we all know about digital. That um, all the change that you felt in journalism, in in politics that you've seen, in revolutions and things like that that you've seen over the past few years, it is nothing. It is the first glimmer of massive change that's going to occur because of the of the speed and the nature in which technology is building in our society and around the, and around the globe. Um, and if you, it, the best way to uh, uh, look at that for a second is, uh, it's a lesson from six, uh, the year 600. Um, it involves an emperor uh, in uh, present day what's now India. Uh, and this is a story that the tech industry is well aware of. But what happened was he, he loved chess and he wanted to give the inventor of chess, a reward uh, for inventing this beautiful game. So the, he had the inventor come to the palace, and uh, the inventor asked for a grain of rice, put it on the first square of the chessboard, and then said, let's put two grains of rice on the next square of the chessboard, four, then eight, then 16, then 32, then 64. And at the end of the 64 doublings, Mr. Emperor, that's, that would be a great gift I would be able to eat, my family would be able to eat. The Emperor thought that was a very modest request, probably thinking that he, a bunch of rice like that, couldn't believe that that's all the inventor wanted, and said, so be it, and ordered uh, his other ministers to go get the amount of rice. The problem is, and this is very important to understand about where we are with technology today, the problem is the emperor and the human mind is not very good at understanding the exponential amplifying effect of constant doubling. It's not good at it, cannot, it just can't really grasp it. And so it turns out that when you do that for 64 times, when you double from one grain of rice, it's 18 quintillion. That's 18 with a whole lot of zeros behind it, or 18 billion billion. And that is a pile of rice that dwarfs Mount Everest and is a pile of rice that would be 1,000 times all the rice produced worldwide in 2010. Okay, when the emperor realized uh, the mistake that he had made in giving the inventor uh, this basically his whole kingdom, he just had the, uh, the inventor beheaded. <laughs> now, 
and, and thereby also uh, basically stunting the new creation of future board games for several centuries. So why is this a lesson for uh, policymakers and future presidents today? Why is it a lesson? And it, it's, it's really something, again, goes back. Remember that rice doubling. Moore's Law. Computer, po pro computer processing power doubles every two years. And it has been for a long time. We're already through the first half of the test board in terms of the doubling. Butter's Law of Photonics, data speed of the network doubles every nine months. Not every two years, every nine months. You put those two things together. By the way, with them, what's happening is not only the processing power doubling, but the cost of that processing power gets cuts in half. And the size of the chip that can carry that processor, processing power shrinks, which is why sooner or later it starts getting into being able to fit in something like a phone and things like that. But I want to just, uh, it's pretty interesting. I went back in preparing for this, looked at 25 years. Where, where were we when, when George Bush became president of the United States? And it turns out, very interesting thing. In 1990, the second year of the president's term, this one computer, this one PC, was the world's first web server. And the World Wide Web was born on that day in 1990. One machine. 25 years later, all that doubling of processing power, all the speeding of the network, it, and more people joining the network. Today, 2.4 billion people worldwide are on the internet. Six billion people have cell phones. Most of them now are becoming smartphones uh, that are connected to the internet. And, they're, and that smartphone sales are moving so fast that it's exceeding the, p the sale of PCs. And we can no longer keep up with how many there are. I mean, the, the number keeps moving by the hundreds of millions in a very short period. And 1.5 million industrial robots and millions more that are doing a lot of other things besides industrial robotics and manufacturing. That now happened over 25 years. And here's the really important thing uh, to understand and grasp about this and why it's mattering more today than it ever has. All of that, all the processing power that happened over the 25 years, all the doubling of the speed of the network, the power that is in an individual's hand today doubles in the next two years. All of it goes into the palm of someone's hand and they have that power to connect, to interact with their government, to challenge the government, to, to do many things that are both huge opportunities and represent big challenges for how uh, how we move forward. So that doubling, I mean, that's why you're seeing things like Google Glass, uh, drones that can deliver books. Uh, they can deliver other things, unfortunately, too. Um, ge uh, the genomics, um, all kinds of things that are going to be put, create ethical questions and other questions that are going to be coming into the fore in very, very short order. And you know, government isn't really all that ready for this, in my view. We're, in a lot of ways, we have policies that are in the 20th, 20th century uh, for 21st century technology and, and, and speed. Um, I want to give you just one example from 10 years ago in the Dean campaign. The FEC, the Federal Election Commu Commission, had this really uh, great law, uh, which was that all people had to file their uh, financial reports, both contributions and spending, on paper. And, you know, when you had a few hundred, maybe a few thousand at most people giving money to the average candidate in a quarter, that was a stack of paper about yay high. Um, and that's what the rule was written for back in the 1970s. But in 2004, with the network growing, uh, what the FEC had never contemplated was 159,000 people giving money to a single candidate in a one-week period uh, in the end of the June quarter. 
we literally were in non or near non-compliance because we couldn't get this stuff done in time. The law was changed now in time for the Obama election of 2008. But what's fascinating to me is 10 years later, in 2014, because this happened in 2004, 10 years later, the United States Senate still requires all filings having to do with the Senate to be done on paper. This is 10 years after we know that things need to change. So, can, you know, can government keep up? Because the next two years and four years and six years, if, if you believe what you've, the, the last uh, uh, few years have seen disruption and change, um, have seen like overpowering different ways politics have been conducted, watched journalism change dra dramatically and drastically, watched um, the Arab Spring and other things that were not necessarily created by social media, but certainly were different and fueled differently by social media. The next two years, it doubles, four years, again doubles, six years, it's going to be very big change. It's going to affect everything from employment and unemployment to our national security. And so today, um, uh, we're going to look at two, two uh, different panels. The first one uh, with a bunch of really bright folks who've been really looking at how democracy and, and governance uh, can be improved, can take uh, advantage of both the opportunities, but also meet the challenges of the digital age. Um, uh, and Olivier Knox, the Washington, chief Washington correspondent for Yahoo News, will take over now, and I'll return uh, right after the break with the second panel. Thank you. <laughs>